Welcome to the Bookman's Corner. I'm your host, Lois Lindstrom. Today we'll discuss a book that will resonate with many and dismay others. The book's title is War is a Lie by David Swanson. Welcome to our show, David. Thanks for having me. And your book, War is a Lie, is a thorough examination of every major argument used to justify wars, drawing on evidence from numerous past wars with a focus on those that had been most widely defended as just and good. And your book's focus is on the U.S. role in wars. As noted journalist Daniel Ellsberg posted, this book is a terrific tool for recognizing and resisting war lies before it's too late. And journalist Karen Young wrote, this book may be the most comp comprehensive anti-war statement available in the English language. David Swanson's books include When the World Outlawed War and War No More, The Case for Abolition. He resides in Charlottesville, Virginia, and is the host of Talk Nation Radio and blogs at davidswanson.org. What was the biggest lie that pr promoted our country to, to, to go to war? <laughs> What's the biggest lie? Well, there are specific lies and there are general lies, and that's a tough one to pick the number one, but I would have to say, in terms of specific lies, it is a lie that was created after a war. It's the lie that World War II had something to do with saving the Jews. When, of course, the reality is that the U.S. led big public conferences of the world's nations mm -hmm. and refused to accept the Jews that Hitler, in his madness, wanted to expel for years before he wanted to kill. Mm. And, 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 of course, that's documented in your book. Um, Daniel, I, I'm curious, did, did you serve in the military or did any of your close family members serve? Well, I don't consider it a service and don't use that language, but no, the answer is no. I didn't grow up with a military family or a peace activist family. I did grow up in the D.C. area where militarism is Very everywhere. Big. Yes, yes, yes. And what inspired you to write this book? Well, you know, during the, the war on Iraq, specifically mm -hmm. the part that began in 2003 and really hasn't ended, uh, there were some very smart, informed people who told me this was brand new. Never before had a U.S. government lied about a war. And I knew that wasn't quite right. Mm -hmm. So I looked into past wars led by the United States and other countries around the world over the past millennia. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't find a single war that hadn't been started with lies, continued with lies, beautified after the fact with lies. A war based on lies is just a long-winded way of saying a war. And, and, and your book beautifully documents this. I mean, on, on page 173, you provide some vital statistics about the number of civilians killed in various wars. I mean, you wrote that 67% of the population who died in World War II were civilians, and then 61% of the population who died in Korea were civilians, and 77% of the population that died in the Vi were civilians that died in the Vietnam War. I mean, I was shocked to, to, to read about all these dead civilians. Well, well, do, I don't think people know that. Those are good numbers if you're concerned with civilians. They've only gone up from there. Uh, recent wars, 80, 90 <sighs> percent and more of the dead have been civilians. Wars are one-sided slaughters that happen where people live uh, in the countries where they are fought. Mm, mm -mm. And you wrote, in our current society, war, war is the norm. It's, it's war in our TVs, uh, in our movies, our toys, and we now have a standing army, plus Congress routinely dumps half of our discretionary money into the military, no questions asked. I mean, why isn't the American public more concerned about this? It darn well ought to be. Uh, <laughs> yeah. War is the biggest waster of money, the biggest eroder of civil liberties, the biggest propagator of bigotry and racism, one of the biggest destroyers of the natural environment. It is an institution that needs to be done away with for a dozen strong reasons. Uh, but it's important to remember that war hasn't been normalized in the sense that everybody does it. Most of us in the biggest war-making country ever seen have nothing to do with war directly, yes. uh, and that's been the norm throughout the existence of our species. Okay, well you wrote that if war lies were not all over the media, people would not learn about them in the first place. I mean, once learned, the public believes the lie that we must go to war. And can you tell us more about the media's role in this? Without the U.S. corporate media, there would not be the recent U.S. wars. It has been absolutely key in promoting the myths that war is necessary, that war is beneficial, that there's some sort of quasi-legal justification for each war. Uh, the media has this blood on its hands up to its shoulders. 
the, the war uh, talk before we invaded Iraq. Wasn't, the media was really behind it too, wasn't it? What's, what's different in that case uh, is the swiftness with which prominent lies were exposed and, and the acceptance that they had been lies was made the norm. Uh, and you had outlets like the New York Times apologizing for the role they had played. That's the exception. Mm. The, the campaign of lies and misinformation and war propaganda is the norm, yep. with, with not the, just the norm, but universal. I, it, it was just incredible. Um, well, I found it interesting to read in your book that wars are not fought about flags or ideas or nations or demonized dictators. They are fought against people, and 98% of whom are resistant to killing, and most of whom had little or nothing to do with bringing on the war. Can you elaborate on this? Well, as we said, the, the wars don't just kill a demonized dictator, uh, an Assad or Gaddafi or Hussein, they kill people, 99% of whom are not the government or the dictator who's being demonized in the media. And when I say 98% of people are resistant to that, I mean, it, with 98% or more of humans, it takes intense training and conditioning to get people to, to kill other human beings. Uh, they have mm. to be conditioned to do it before thinking. Mm. And then, of course, they're left with moral injury and post-traumatic stress disorder sure. and all sorts of, of after effects. Well, you know, but let's talk, let's talk about switch gears here and let's talk about the good war, World War II, because so many of us have been, have been told that our involvement in World War II ended the Great Depression. Is that true in your view? It contributed to ending the Great Depression. I don't think that would begin to justify it, and you could have ended the Great Depression much more easily and much more effectively with public spending on something other than war. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, so when you defend a disastrous counterproductive program that makes us less safe, destroys the natural environment, erodes our liberties, and on and on and on, with the claim that it's somehow a jobs program, not only is that sociopathic on its own terms, but it's false. Yes. It's false. There have been studies done, particularly at the University of Massachusetts, Massachusetts Amherst that find that if you put the money in education or green energy or just about anything else or even don't tax it from working people in the first place, you get more jobs and better paying jobs and better economic mm. impact. So it's actually a drain on our economy in addition to all its other faults. Mm, that's a good point. Well, uh, and I saw also found it interesting to read in your book that uh, General Manuel Noriego, who worked for the CIA, um, included in he he, you wrote that his biggest offense was he refused to back the U.S. war against Nicara Nicaragua during the Reagan administration. Well, tell us more about Noriego, who supposedly, and this is in your book, snorted cocaine in red underwear with women who were not his wife. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm citing there the media case, the, pro the propaganda case for the war, which is, of course, ludicrous. It's not a reason to go bomb people in another country who don't really have a military to speak of, who are no threat to you, uh, to go and bomb them because of these characteristics of their leader, who, as I note, a short time before, like Gaddafi, like Assad, like Hussein, and on and on and on, had been uh, an ally and an employee and a weapons customer. And so the, these, these dictators that the United States exports and props up and supports can become too independent or simply too convenient a target, and then they're demonized and used as a war justification. It, it's, it's amazing. Well, well, can you list some of the countries where the United States has overthrown various go governments? Can you list, list some <laughs> of these countries? Well, we don't have a long enough show, but... Uh, I, I mean, I couldn't a, believe it. It was, like, it was like two paragraphs of countries. Well, there are at least three dozen cases of the United States successfully overthrowing a country's government, many of them democracies since World War II. There are 50 or more or over 50 cases of assassinations and attempted assassinations of foreign leaders, uh, 90 to 100 at least uh, interferences with foreign elections, which, you know, Russia, to the extent that it does this, is, is you know, amateur stuff. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so look at Venezuela right now, Iran right now, successful overthrow, a coup in Honduras just some years back, a successful coup in Ukraine just some years back. And of course, the problems with Iran date right back to the successful destruction of their democracy in 1953 with a CIA coup that put a brutal dictator in charge of Iran, whose son is now sitting here in the Washington, D.C. area waiting his turn to be imposed on Iran. Oh, my gosh. Well, do you think that there's a good chance we're going to invade Iran? Because it seems like there's a lot of war talk about I Iran being a, a bad actor. <laughs> well, I don't use we to speak of the U.S. military, but there is a decent chance the U.S. military is going to invade Iran, and there's a decent chance that despite resistance within the U.S. military and even in the White House, 
a, 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 an incident is going to provoke retaliation and it's going to spiral and escalate into a major war because of the, the tension that's been built up but, there. But do you think this is because the uh, because our military industrial complex wants a war with Iran? Is that what, is that what you're saying? It, it is extremely profitable. Studies have already been done of the profits to be made for the weapons dealers and other Whoa. war profiteers. That's mm. one motivation. Well, you know, you wrote that most of the world ended slavery and colonial rule without wars, and you wrote that if Congress had found the decency to end slavery through legislation, perhaps the nation would not have had, had to end it with this terrible civil war. But many will disagree with that statement. I mean, why do you believe the civil, civil war was re a result of lies? Well, I think... Uh, a couple points here. One is that most countries on earth ended slavery and serfdom without having a mass murderous civil war. And even in Washington, D.C., within the boundaries of Washington, D.C., this mm -hmm. was done with compensated emancipation. Mm -hmm. uh, so you, you're attaching a just cause of ending slavery to a, to a brutal, barbarous action, which mm -hmm. is war, and that mm -hmm. connection doesn't justify. The other is, you know, without looking back and saying, let's imagine changing history, which of course you can't do, mm -hmm. looking forward, if we decided we wanted to end mass incarceration or uh, some other injustice, and we picked out some big fields out in the country and killed a million of our young people, and then passed a law to end mass incarceration, what would that brutal act of mass murder have accomplished? Why not jump straight to passing the law to end mass incarceration? Ooh, well, that's, that's an unusual example. Um, and, and, and going forward in history, you wrote that the Afghanistan war, already the longest in U.S. history, is still going on today. And you wrote that when the U.S. attacked Afghanistan on October 7, 2001, the Taliban offered to negotiate for the handing over of bin Laden. And President George W. Bush rejected that offer. And then the Taliban offered to simply turn over bin Laden to a third country, and George W. Bush rejected that offer, too. I would, I don't think people realize this. I mean, well, can you tell us more? We should note that the Afghan government, the Taliban government, wanted to turn bin Laden over to a third country that would be fair and non-biased and not have the death penalty. They didn't want to send him to the United States. But the United States did not want to negotiate, did not want bin Laden. He, as Bush later said, was not of much interest. What the United States government wanted was a war. And if you look again at any war, name some wars, and I will tell you how peace had to be carefully avoided. There's this myth that war is a last resort. We tried other things. No, no, no. You have to very carefully avoid peace negotiations to get a war started. And that's where the urgency comes from. We must bomb Iraq before the inspectors can finish. And, you know. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, uh, I just, and also, I found it very eye-opening that we pay Afghans who, who are fighting with the Taliban. You wrote that the, the largest source of revenue for the Taliban are U.S. taxpayers. I mean, we lock people away for giving a, uh, giving a pair of socks to the enemy, while our, our own government serves as the chief financial sponsor to the Taliban. I was shocked to read that in your book. Well, it's a close call now between two sources of income for the Taliban. The other possible leading source of income is, is opium, which, oh, yeah, uh, of, course, of course, just prior to the war, the Taliban had eradicated. And immediately after the invasion, it's become the biggest uh, exporter of opium. But there was a report called War Incorporated that uh, by an uh, oversight committee in the U.S. House of Representatives, the subcommittee on, uh, on national security and foreign affairs, that found that, this, that in fact, the, the amount of money the U.S. military was paying the Taliban for safe passage down roads and so forth was uh, at least among the top two sources of income. I think I, th I just find that incredible. I just find that incredible. The poor American taxpayer. Well, you know, what do you think about the, uh, when would that war end, you think? When do you think we will get out of Afghanistan? Well, that, yeah, that's the question, is when will the U.S. leave? It's not when will something be achieved, because they have yet to define what it is that they're trying well, to achieve. Yeah, what is the mission? What is the mission? Well, I have no idea. I, I don't understand. You know, up to a point, you could have claimed the mission was to kill Osama bin Laden, well, which, as we done. discussed, was ridiculous, but it's also been done. <laughs> so it's, it's doubly out of the picture. Uh, okay. Yeah, it, it, it needed to be ended before it ever begun. It, it's, it's needed to be ended and, every and minute and, since. And, and the poor people there are. Oh. Well, you, you wrote that uh, the, the problem with wars is not that soldiers aren't brave or well-intentioned or that their parents didn't raise them well. So many young Americans signed up to risk their lives in the global war on terrorism, believing that they would be defending their nation. Were the American troops that, were, that, were, that served in Iraq, were they deceived? 
They were indeed uh, in the details of the lies to start the war and in the general claim that war can somehow be legal and acceptable and beneficial and do some good in the world. It can't. And many non-military members and non-veterans are likewise deceived by the same misunderstanding. Uh, it's, it's something that needs to be undone in our culture. It's the same thing that leads someone to shoot up a bunch of people in Virginia Beach just recently and endless mass shootings. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and the mass shooters, of course, are very disproportionately veterans. Uh, well, most veterans, of course, are not mass shooters. Uh, it, it is a problem that comes back from these wars. Um, I'm, I, it's, it's amazing. And so let's revisit again the, the Vietnam War. You wrote that one of President Nixon's ideas was to drop nukes, but then uh, that didn't happen. But another was this, another idea was the saturation bombing of Hanoi and Haiphong. And Nixon actually ordered this. Our military dropped and I, this is in your book, 36,000 tons of bombs on those two cities and, tw and 12 days. Yeah. I mean, 12 days and 36,000 tons of bombs. Uh, I yeah. mean, please tell us more. The, the war on Vietnam, which the Vietnamese called the American War, not even counting the bombing of Laos and Cambodia, was essentially World War II concentrated onto one tiny country with these B-52 bombers saturating the country with bombs. These same big bombing airplanes that they've just shipped over to Iran to threaten mm. Iran with. Four million dead human beings in Vietnam. If you made that Vietnam Memorial on the National Mall in Washington, D.C., have every name on it, not just the American names, it would fill the National Mall. But, but I just also think about the environmental damage that was done. Isn't it, that must be enormous. After all, I mean, how can uh, you recover uh, from that? Well, you can't. The, 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 the poisoning of, of the, of the Vietnam, water and the fields and the, I mean, it's just incredible. The, 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 the damage continues to be done, including to human beings from the Agent Orange and all the other poisons, uh, as in the more so recent so wars. So depressing. Well, uh, do you think President Barack Obama was a man of peace? I mean, what happened to the U.S. defense budget when he was president? Well, it's not defensive, so I don't call it that, but it escalated. Uh, it set new records, and it has set yet newer records since under President Trump. But uh, I, don't with I don't think this is being reported, do you? I mean, do you think that, that the press is reporting this? I, I don't think most people know that uh, President Obama oversaw, as he campaigned on and kept his promise, for a much bigger U.S. military with more bases, a bigger presence around the world, in Africa, in Asia, and so forth, uh, and that he launched a horrific, uh, disastrous war on Libya that has had negative impacts in 15, 16 surrounding countries. Uh, and, and I don't know how many people know how Donald Trump has escalated each of the several wars that he inherited from Obama, you know, with Congress going right along. I know. Well, that's that's the incredible part. I mean, we, they just go, they just sign off and go, yes, let's just keep spending. Um, well, I, I mean, how much does this, let's get down to how much does the U.S. military spend on defense today? Do you know that number? Oh, virtually nothing. Uh, if you eliminated the weapons that are purely offensive, that you can't make any claim that they're defensive in any way, you could eliminate most of the U.S. military. And if you just did a fraction of that, you could spark a reverse arms race. When the U.S. spends less, China spends less. This is, this is the role the U.S. needs to play, is leading a reverse arms race. But the U.S. spends about as much as the rest of the world put together. Uh, how much money is that? One and a quarter trillion dollars a year across uh, numerous agencies, okay. so not just Department of so-called defense, but okay. homeland so-called security and state and so-called energy, which is nuclear weapons mm -hmm. primarily, and all the agencies. One and a quarter trillion dollars. Mm -mm -mm. Well, how now let's let's talk about Iraq. How bad was President George W. Bush's t a team in terms of telling lies about getting the U.S. to invade Iraq? I mean, the, the weapons of mass destruction was was the big lie, right? They they were less skilled at it than mm. many other administrations, and oh. so the lies were more quickly exposed than I with see. many other administrations. Uh, whether that was to our advantage in terms of exposing the fact that all wars are based on lies, I don't know. Maybe, but uh, certainly there was no hesitation. Uh, I don't know of any administration where there has been any hesitation to tell lies to start wars. Mm -mm -mm. Well, you, you explained in your book that some societies and countries avoid war and are cited are cited in the global peace index and you listed the top 20 nations as of 2010 um, well, tell us about the top three nations uh, that are in the peace index. Who would that be? Like Iceland would be one? My guess, uh, correct me if I'm wrong because I don't remember, my, but I was th certainly would include Iceland, which has no military. Costa Rica, which has no military. Uh, I, I 
I don't know who, who the t number three would be, but there are a handful of countries that have no military at all, have put their military in a museum. A and of course, every country on earth uh, is closer to the zero dollars that Costa Rica spends than they are to the one and a quarter trillion that, that the United States does. Yeah. I mean, you call this the, the poverty draft. <laughs> I mean, people, young guys, young women are joining the military because it's, it's a it's a career, right? Yeah, I, I mean, especially after 9-11, a lot of people joined for what they thought were noble reasons, mm -hmm. uh, and people joined for a whole compli complicated set of reasons, but the vast majority in polls say they joined, among other reasons, because they didn't have any other good choice for a career. Uh, and it, it, disproportionately, the recruiting happens in poorer neighborhoods. Uh, and it's called volunteer, but anything else I go and volunteer for, I'm allowed to stop. Volunteering, that's what it means to volunteer. Yes. Not in the US military, they got you for eight years and they got you for as long as they want okay. beyond that. So, if so it's eight years, when you sign up it's eight years. It's eight years and it says we can change this contract any way we want but you can't. So oh. it's nine years, 10 years, it's whatever they want. Oh my goodness, oh my goodness. Well let's discuss bombs and drones. You wrote that proponents of aerial bombing have argued from the start that it could bring, a, it, that it would bring faster peace, discourage a populace from continuing a war, or shock and awe them, but this has always proved false. Well, can you tell us more? This has been the claim since the, the bombings of, of Japan and Germany in World War II, yeah. right up to the present day, that, you know, and, and the terrorist attack on, on Baghdad that was labeled shock and awe. Uh, this was the theory, right, against all evidence over decades. The evidence is all exactly the opposite. You, you enrage people against you. The theory is that we will shock them and awe them and they will not only surrender out of fear and horror, but will love us and welcome us <laughs> as liberators and give us chocolate and flowers. It, it ha you know, the Canadians were supposed to do that in the War of 1812, right? Mm -hmm. it, thousands of wars, never has it been true, but and it's and the claim, it's, it, it, it's the it, theory. And that's right, the theory still goes forward. Well, um, you wrote that um, Congress repeatedly chooses to fund wars while pretending it has no choice. I found it interesting that you, the, when, did, when you questioned Congressman Steny Hoyer in June of 2010, he and his colleagues had been increasing the overall military budget and he was working hard to fund the escalation of the war in Afghanistan with a supplemental bill that would keep the expenses off the books outside the budget. And so two questioners asked Hoyer why he wasn't trimming the DOD budget, but rather he was trimming, they were trimming Social Security and Medicare. And what was his response? I, I, I have no choice, so, you know, I, I, that's not an option, you know, and that's what they say right up to this day. Uh, but, you know, to, to move, you could take 3% of U.S. military spending and end starvation on Earth. You could take 1.1% of mm. U.S. military spending and end the lack of clean drinking water on Earth. We could have trains like other countries. We could have school, college, and preschool all the way through free and top quality like other countries. We could have health care for everyone like other countries. And a Green New Deal pays for itself. Single payer health care pays for itself. For the War doesn't. I mean, if we, if, we, if we could just divert some of the money from DOD to, to these other issues. I mean, the American right. public, I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing, isn't That's it? That's right. Just just move 100 billion or 200 or 300 billion. Take your pick. Do it by stages. But move the money back from the death machine to human and environmental needs. Uh, well, who was the first U.S. president to send uh, U.S. troops to fight against a foreign government without congressional approval, because I mean, before it was supposed to be that Congress should sign off before we go to war. Well, who was the first one to say, "We don't, I don't need Congress"? Oh boy, well, was, was uh, that was that McKinley? Was that was that? Well, I, I, it's probably George Washington, depending on which Native American <laughs> tribes you count as a foreign government, okay. right? We don't count these as real wars because those weren't real nations. But, but you know, the last time that Congress passed a declaration of war was was in the days after Pearl Harbor, right. uh, first against Japan, then against Germany. Right, Roosevelt right. drafted both at okay. first, and then we'll, okay. we'll just do Japan. So after, uh, you know, after, immediately after FDR, there hasn't been a declaration of war since. Wow, that's incredible, and, we, and there's been so many invasions. Well, you, you wrote that the, um, the most dangerous war laws are the, those that beautify a past war because they make people more trusting about new wars. For example, um, President Obama suddenly declared that the, the, the Korean War was a victory after so many decades of virtually everyone calling it a disastrous draw. And why did he do that? 
because it's good for current wars and future wars for past wars to be glorified. It, why is the National Mall, every inch of the thing, filling up with war monuments? War monuments now being built to the Gulf War and the, and the war on terrorism, even as it's increased terrorism and is ongoing without end. It's important for them to have monuments that build acceptability of past war. I mean, the total destruction of North Korea that has those people traumatized to this day that resulted in nothing but the putting the border back where a couple of drunk colonels had put it in the first place. Uh, I, I mean, it was considered a disaster for year after year after year. And then Obama says that. I don't know if people believe that now. Yeah, yeah. And then, uh, th and then of course, the, the, the Pentagon w is calling Vietnam the good war when, the, of course, the evidence of the extent of the killings in, v in Vietnam just is it's just incredible. I mean, how, I mean, people just don't know the facts, do they? You know, that phrase, the good war, really came up for World War II during the war on Vietnam. Because if you were going to oppose a war, you had to find some other war to support. Say, this is the bad war, that's the good war. Like during the wars on Afghanistan and Iraq, when people like Obama would oppose the war on Iraq, they would say, but the war on Afghanistan is the good one. It's, <laughs> it's very hard to find someone who will oppose the whole institution of war as entirely bad, which it is. Yeah, it is, yeah. And, uh, and then I, th I found that the... Um, the the in your the information on, in your book about the Syrian conflict was enormously interesting. You wrote a Russian proposal to eliminate Syria's chemical weapons had already been sh uh, shared with the White House back in 2013 and rejected. And when Kerry publicly suggested that Syria avoid war by handing over its chemical weapons, everyone knew he didn't mean it. But fortunately, Obama did not go to war then because it, the public really didn't want war. But down the road, we became involved in the Syrian civil war. How, how did we get involved? Yes, indeed. Well, I didn't, and I don't use we for the U.S. military, but the U.S. military got involved in Syria immediately after the Arab Spring started uh, in Ho and already was, to a very limited degree, involved in trying to overthrow the government of Syria, which it's failed and failed and failed year after year now. But that's been the goal, is to overthrow the government of Syria. And uh, are you think, are they still doing it? Yes. Oh, yeah. Uh, no. they're, still, they're still sending out... Uh, Con Congress, the, the, uh, three quarters of the Congress, bipartisan harmony, no gridlock in, in sight, just told President Trump to, to up the efforts to, to in Syria because of Iranian influence. And, that, that and, go after Iran. That's, that's the purpose but, but of, of going and, after Syria. And, of course, these this millions of refugees are fl flooding out of the country, right? It's just horrible. Millions and millions. The, 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 the dead, the injured, the, the environment destroyed, the people made uh. refugees, the people made refugees blamed for the war, blamed for their own suffering. Mm. It's, it's a vicious cycle. Well, David, I'm, uh, th we could talk another hour, this has been, but our session has come to an end. Thank you so much for being a guest on our program. This Thanks. has been so informative. And, and please tell us where our, our viewers can find your book to, to buy it. Uh, davidswanson.org slash books or your local bookstore, I hope, or any, any online well, bookseller. Well, great. Well, I hope that they go run out and get it. It's <laughs> very, very good. Thanks for watching. Please join us again next month for a new edition of the Bookman's Corner. I'm Lois Lindstrom.